So thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, we will soon hear about our speaker, our topic of uh, podcasting, why this is relevant, and how everybody can do it and use it. But all those cool things are only possible because of our sponsors, and I would like to, uh, Tim to introduce our sponsors today. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'd like to sincerely thank all of our sponsors. I mean, we can't do this without our sponsors. So um, there is what keeps us going, keeps the sponsors going. Um, first of all, Tahoe Luxury Properties. They're our newest sponsor this month. So I know you already introed yourself, but it's great to have you on board. Thank you. I, I won't be redundant here because I've already introduced myself and who we are. But one thing I do want to point out is that we do have some pieces on the way out. If you want to grab, there's listing information. There's also a, a sheet for you to sign up. We do a quarterly market report. So if you have any interest in figuring out what's going on with the current state of the local market, it's quite fascinating. And we can break it down in all sorts of uh, graph formats, which I think makes it very digestible and easy to understand. So please take uh, uh, a moment to sign up for that. And we'll be happy to send you as much information as you want about the local market. Also, we're uh, a rental company. We spe specialize in high-end short-term rentals. Got about 160 homes on our program. Um, everything from, you know, nice secluded cabins in the woods to palatial lakefront estates. So uh, if you're looking for a, a short-term rental uh, where you can hold a reunion, family gathering, whatever it might be, great ski holiday, we've got uh, the properties for you. So thank you, and it's great to be a part of the event. Cool. So thank you, Tahoe Luxury Properties, for sure. Um, next up, Holland and Hart. Their logo somehow escaped from our slides, but Holland and Hart is a sponsor. They're a local law firm. They have offices in, um, in Reno, Carson City, Las Vegas, 60 offices. And um, if anyone wants more information, talk to Dick, the red, white, and blue uh, shirt in the back. Um, they're our attorneys and multiple other people in this room's attorneys, so they're great. Um, and Clear Capital, they're the, the leading uh, provider of real estate valuations, data, and analytics, um, and technology for the real estate Market. If anyone has any questions on that, talk to uh, Garrett. Um, and then we have uh, Truckee Donner Chamber of Commerce. So um, if if there have any events, you can uh, any member of Tahoe Silicon Mountain can attend a chamber event for a member price. So thank you, uh, Truckee Donner Chamber of Commerce. And then um, New Leaders. New Leaders is a software development company that can you know streamline your business. Anything you want automated or built as far as software for your business. That's uh, New leaders. Robert's not here, is he? Um, he's here pretty much every month. But um, so that's uh, new leader. So again, thank you very much to all of our sponsors. If anyone is interested in sponsoring this event for next month or any month, talk to me after. Um, as a sponsorship coordinator, I can hook you up. All right. Okay. So today's speaker, usually when she talks, uh, she is known to be America's crisis coach. And uh, we, but we figured if, if we say we have a, an event about a crisis, then maybe nobody shows up because we're, we're up here in the mountains having a good time. Uh, so we, we, we don't want to have a crisis. Uh, although, uh, as, as we know, it, it can happen even here. And, uh, but she is not just a coach. She's also a best-selling author can uh, look up her books on Amazon. She is also a podcaster. And, and what I like about Silicon Mountain is that we always learn something that is really inspiring and new. And I have to say uh, that I didn't really think a whole lot about the, the audio podcasting as being something to get the word out and to, to be, become known. Uh, but uh, with this topic coming up, all of a sudden, I saw this pop up over the web and in different magazines and in different places. And uh, so I'm very excited to learn more about this. Uh, Kedra Koenig, 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 yes, is the, I always have to make sure I'm not pronouncing it the German way. Uh, she has uh, a lot of experience in this topic. Uh, she uh, will share this as somebody who's actually doing it or not just somebody who has uh, researched it. So I'm very much looking forward and uh, I'm sure you have a lot to say. Uh, if there are questions, just ask them and make sure you get one of those mics when, when you have a question. Thank you. Okay. Being here. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Yes, I am known in pop culture as America's crisis coach and we'll get into that just a little bit. But what I love is that 
I get to play in different playgrounds because I do work with people who are going through the worst times of their lives. I deal with celebrities, professional athletes, everyday people who are managing crisis. And sometimes that can be draining. But one of the wonderful things about my work in podcasting, writing books, is I get opportunities to come and talk to people like yourself who want to learn those types of things. So I'm really thrilled to be here. And as a show host, I am used to conversation. So I would love it if you would ask your questions in real time because I want to deliver content to you that is meaningful and matters to you where you are right now. So if something comes up, let's just take this where we want to go. I have a relatively short slide deck to, number one, not overstay my welcome, and number two, to make it possible for us to have a meaningful interaction, okay? Great. So as we said in the introduction, my name's Phaedra, and I am known in pop culture as America's crisis coach. It is a brand that was actually given to me. I would have never have dubbed myself that, but through the course of helping people with crisis and facing my own crisis, um, it just sort of became um, a brand for myself. And um, as it was said in the introduction, I am an Amazon bestselling author. I am a podcaster, which is what we're gonna talk about tonight. And I help people get through the worst times of their lives. So, a little bit about me. This is my album art. So this is my show, it's called Coming Out of the Fire, and I have cards for you, and we'll talk a little bit about the branding aspect of it, um, and I can hand out some cards for you guys. So this is album art. If, how many of you are even familiar with podcasting? Okay, good, so we have at least a, a launching point. So this is my album art, and yes, the microphone was literally on fire, that is not Photoshopped. <laughs> It's a really cool, clever trick. Um, you can use masking tape and rubber cement, and you can light that on fire. You just need to be ready to put that out quickly. So you can light anything on fire. This particular company, uh, Studio 530, out of what I consider Northern California, uh, far up near Redding, um, they, I've seen them light everything on fire. <laughs> Are you familiar with that area? Oh, very nice. Yes, okay, so we're, we're kindred spirits, yes. So this is my album art, and this is what you see when you go to iTunes or Stitcher. Those are the two main platforms. However, there are many ways to receive podcasts, but the two main um, are iTunes and Stitcher. Stitcher Radio. Yes, I'll show you a logo for it in just a sec. So this was when my podcast launched, and one of the things that you're really striving for when you get a podcast out is to get up on new and noteworthy, as you'll see up in the upper uh, right-hand corner. Yes, okay, I've got to keep my orientation. Um, and I made it to number two in the business category, which is very, very hard to do and something that I'm very, very proud of. And there was a lot of strategy behind that. There is some algorithms that don't make sense, but there are things that you can do to set yourself up for that success. You're allowed to be there six to eight weeks is generally what iTunes has been doing. And um, you actually can be in multiple categories, so I do have screenshots from other areas, but this is the one that I'm most proud of. Can you refer to that as an album cover? What did you call that? These are called album covers, yes. So grow your business, how and why to start a podcast. That's what we're here to talk about tonight, and that's what I would love to share with you and have you ask questions for me about your business and how it would apply to podcasting. So what is podcasting? So podcasting is a free way to deliver information worldwide. And it is a low cost, low effort, depending on how much... Um, processing and how much post-production work you want to do. There are people who literally um, will podcast on the fly. They don't care about background noise. They don't care about any hesitations or weirdness. I actually think that that's unique and cool. I think that that is something that can really set you apart in the podcasting world because those high stylized, overproduced podcasts, they're very expensive. They take a lot of time and people burn. So if you don't have a big financial machine behind you or if you're not passionate about post-production, which a lot of you may be, being tech-savvy people, um, don't feel that that is a requirement for having a podcast. 
So iTunes and Stitcher, those are the two primary vehicles that um, people receive their podcasts. But there are lots and lots of apps that people use. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So here are some podcasting statistics that I wanted to share with you. The demographics are equally male and female. And the ages are 18 to 44. Podcast consumers tend to be affluent and they tend to be well educated. Most likely they are going to use digital media in the car and as of 2016 podcasting became native in a lot of car makes and models. So um, have, have any of you ever seen what the podcast native app looks like on Apple products? So you've seen that. Okay so now that's starting to become normalized even in um, like um, some of the satellite radio companies and what have you, they'll, they actually have their own app and through it you can search. So if you were to search coming out of the fire, it wouldn't matter that my platform is on iTunes Stitcher because my host is Libsyn and it's out there and it makes it available to anybody through any medium. So podcasters are more, or podcast listeners are more likely to use digital media in their car and podcast consumers tend to be high social media users, which makes sense, right? They're very savvy. They um, already understand the benefit of social media. They understand how to share information. They're going to see a random podcast um, episode in a Twitter feed and be like, whoa, what's that? And they're not necessarily going to go to iTunes search for a specific interest level, even though they are keyword rich and, and they are... Um, recognize that way but a lot of times people find a podcast through the social media platform podcast consumers tend to listen to podcast audio, audio over other forms of audio we were having some of these conversations before all i do is listen to podcasts I, you just i really rarely hear music going in my car and because um having d multiple devices i can literally be listening in my car turn my car off walk seamlessly into my home and still be consuming content and I find that very um, easy for me to just keep the experience alive. And more and more people are doing that. Does anybody have any questions yes. about the statistics? So, so do you know, what's the share of uh, consumers who was in the car as opposed to not in the car? Because that, that would be the most natural place for me to do it. Is that the majority? Or is it it, the majority is in the car? Yeah. Yes, there is a, another majority that is going to be listening in the gym, on their bicycles. Commute time is generally the highest consumption time for podcasts. So there is some strategy to when people release their podcasts, paying attention to time zones and paying attention to commute times. There is a uh, school of thought that podcasts should be 22 to 23 minutes because that is the national average for a commute. However, more and more people are like, I'm putting out high quality content, it will end when it ends. And those who are fans, they'll you know, pick up where they left off kind of thing. So does that answer that? Okay. Anybody else have a question about statistics? Yes. Um, listening to podcasts in your car, how do you get the signal? Do you have to be in Wi-Fi range or do you have what, through what magical uh, wavelengths yeah, sure. do you get? Sure. So one of the ways to capture your podcast if you're a fan is to subscribe. And if you subscribe to a podcast, it automatically downloads when the host releases it. So then it's part of your device. And then depending on how you consume information off of a device. So for me, I have a Ford Explorer and um, it has Bluetooth. So I can listen to my podcast in my car through my speakers, but it's actually coming from my device. But as I said, starting 2016, podcasting became native. So like Sirius Radio, you know how it's in your car, um, you could actually get to podcast that you're wincing. But for some people that would work. Um, so <laughs> you, if it's pre-downloaded, it's going to be available to you. So if you're, right, okay. If you're going to go onto an airplane or anything like that, as long as you download the information ahead of time. Another thing is every podcast has a podcast website associated with it. So you can actually go and listen to um, the information from the website directly. But for that downloading, you need Wi-Fi or, or G 4G? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're going to need yeah. some way to... There are a lot of places in the mountains where there's not, mm -hmm. including radio stations. We get NPR and everything else is kind of sketch. Sketch, right. 
So if you have a subscription, the second year in range, it's gonna just download and you'll get notifications. Whatever, and then when I leave the house, then it's already on my phone. So it's your device. Yeah. Two quick questions. What's the difference between a podcast and an audiobook? And then secondly, what are the top three most popular categories of content? Like entertainment or Okay. So the difference between a podcast and an audio book. An audio book is going to be a pre-recorded MP3. It's going to be somehow on, um, like in Wistia, or so, it's going to be held somewhere in a host. Um, a podcast is going to be recurring, consistent content that is put out with the intent to be consumed for free. So you could do a podcast that is an, reading an audio book, but most people go to like Audible or, or some platform like that to consume audiobooks. And then you were asking about the top three categories. Um, I think that's subjective to what you prefer. So there are many, many categories in iTunes. Um, business, religion, self-help, children, families, what have you. It just really depends. Most people vying are going to say being in the business category because if you look at these demographics, that's where the people are, right? Um, so it just depends on what you're trying to do with your content and who you're trying to attract. And we're going to get a little bit more into that about how you would choose that and how you would make those decisions. Sure. Yes, so here's the thing. Um, video podcasting is becoming very popular. Um, it is also, and we'll talk about this more, about repurposing content. So a lot of people will do a podcast and they will have it transcribed and they will have that in available for download or consumption on their website. Some people also strip audio from a video and they'll release the audio as a podcast. If, if you subscribe to TED Talks as a podcast, you, their videos will show up on your screen. So there are a number of ways to um, have the content. I know I, there are ones that I subscribe to um, that are actually have been released because repurposing content is a wonderful thing to do on podcasts. And, and they've taken and they've broken down like an hour long talk and they release it in you know 15 minute increments once a week so they they'll release four podcasts in a week which for people who are voracious podcast consumers they like to have content coming yeah okay so let's talk about why to start a podcast so podcast is a freemium way to deliver content does everyone understand the term freemium so podcasts are free we don't charge people to listen to the content. There are people who can get savvy and do it, I will tell you that. Perhaps they set it up to where you can only get up to six to 10 sh um, releases at a time, and if you want more, you need to opt in and perhaps pay, but that is rare, and you better be fairly high echelon that people would part money for your podcast. Most people, it's, it's free content, so it's a freemium. It's a, it's a uh, low cost, low um, stress way for people to get to know, like, and trust you. So it's a wonderful relationship builder. It's an effective exchange of information. So podcasts can be anything you want them to be. They can be a monologue. They can be a dialogue with someone. They could be an interview. They can be a round table. They can be anything that, they, that you want it to be. And it's an excellent way to exchange information. There are podcasts that are three minutes long. They're the like, start your day off right, you know, Morning Boost is one of the most popular podcasts in the world crazy amount of downloads and it's a five minute podcast what's that what's that morning the morning boost yes and what makes that podcast so great the gentleman who runs it is a friend of mine you've heard his voice many many times he's on many movie trailers his name is scott smith and he's also the voice at disney world that you hear a lot so people love his voice he's been in podcast or he's been in um radio and production for many many years so his podcast is just stylized it's highly produced it's a very very it's it's ear candy so people really like that 
uh, podcast will enhance brand loyalty. So if you have a product, a good, or a service, and you really want people to pick you above your competition, one of the cool ways to do that is with podcasting. And I'll give you an example. Have any of you ever had a loyalty to like a morning commute show, the, dri the morning drive? and you like the way those guys talk, and you like what they talk about, and you like the way they do it, you can develop that for yourself through your podcast. One of the wonderful things about podcasting is it enhances what you do. So perhaps you sell this widget, right? But over here, you've got this really cool thing about you. Well, the cool thing about you is what people are attracted to and what will create that brand loyalty. So maybe you're like a fan of... Um, a television show, maybe you're a gamer, maybe you love you know, um, Deadpool. You can create brand awareness and enhance the brand loyalty by showing that underbelly, so to speak, because people love the personal touch. So by getting to know you and your quirks, it's just like the morning show. It's like, hey, you know, what'd you do last night? Oh, you know, blah, 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 whatever they say, right? And you get to have your flavor. So if your flavor is you're a little bit snarky, which is how we run on my show, then you get to be that way, right? And for me, as an example, when you saw that imagery of me, some of the market feedback when I was really starting out was, you look like, you know, 10 feet tall and, and somewhat unapproachable. And anyone who knew me would say, you don't know her at all, <laughs> like at all. And by doing my podcast, people really know me. And they, like, I get stopped in the street, I get stopped in the airport. It's like, ah, everyone feels like I'm their, their friend, right? So I've been able to grow that tribe. And if people had just gone to my website, they might have made a judgment and it could have been a turnoff or what have you. So it has been able to enhance brand loyalty. So again, growing the know, like, and trust. The cool thing about podcasting, and this is really valuable from a advertising perspective, it's evergreen. So imagine when you've gone out and you've recruited people to do advertising, as we've had the people here. As people fall off, they're going to change that slide I make up in my head. And with a podcast, if you are a sponsor, if you went back five years from now, and when people are always dropping into your podcasting funnel, all new listeners are coming in every day. Once they love you, they go back and they consume everything you've ever done. So that advertising that was on episode 25 and you're at episode 1000, it's still going to be heard. And that's very, very powerful when you're um, giving a prospectus to people who want to invest and advertise with you and your company. It's a really great thing to say. Look, millions of people are going to hear your content. There is literally no end to the advertising benefit. The reach is perpetual, which is again what I'm saying. It's just out there, um, as long as you keep your podcast unlimited, which you can do, you control that, that means that there is no end to the amount of people. And, and you will get stats. Your hosting will provide the stats for you so you can have that to share with other people. You have total control of content and how it is delivered. In, how, how many of you have heard of indie publishing? I mean, a lot of you are in the indie world, right, with your startups and things like that. Okay, we recognize now that publishing your own content gives you full and complete control. There is nobody who's going to come back and censor you other than, say, iTunes. And I'll give you an example of that. iTunes used to allow you to show each and every episode as either explicit or not. And in my show, I have people from all walks of life, and I'll just give you a tidbit of what my show's about. My show, I interview people who have been through traumatic high-end crisis. People who have been in plane crashes, people who have lost their homes to tornadoes, people who have had family members murdered, really um, out-of-the-box type of crises, right? And those people um, come on and um, share that story. If I limited and told people, as we said earlier, you know, we need to be careful about the words that come out of our mouth. If I were to um, censor people, it would really affect their story because some people, one gentleman in particular, was born into a cult and he was very traumatically abused and he came out the other side and he's a very edgy guy, right? If you like a bad boy, you want to listen to that episode. 
if I were to tell him or had to bleep out content, number one, that's time consuming for me. And number two, it waters down his message. So I used to be able to just deem a certain episode explicit. iTunes has changed their policy. And once you have an explicit, they rate your whole show as explicit. Originally, I was like, Ugh, because I have a lot of Christian based people coming onto my show. And to be honest, that is my heart and my um, goal with my show. And to see their names with an explicit, I worried that they would not want to be associated with that. I'm telling you, it's not been a problem. However, I have the control of the content, how it's delivered, how long it is, how I interact, all that full control. It's very, very powerful, and it's very, very rewarding when you're putting your heart and soul into your podcast. Um, it's a compliment to social media, as we were talking about earlier. Um, Having a social media presence, how many of you use social media and have a fan page or a business page? Okay, and it's very difficult with your algorithms to get in front of people, right? But podcasting, you can use it in such unique ways. And if you learn how to hack some of the systems as far as your imagery and when to put in your link and how to do it, you can actually expand your reach. And because the content is keyword rich, you can actually get onto radars that you might not have been able to get on with just having a fan page or just having social media. Um, it's a lead generator for new clients. So for me, I use podcasting as a lead generator. I use it for no like, and trust, all those good things that we've talked about. But truly and honestly, what I'm trying to do is build my list. Now, when I say build my list, does that make sense to all of you? Okay. Anybody it doesn't make sense to? Excellent. So I'm really trying to get people to build my list. That is my end all be all. There's subs, um, subsequent benefits, which I'm going to talk about in a few slides. But really, that is my main focus. It creates an opportunity to capture people for your list. It's an effective way to establish expertise and credibility. It's a wonderful way. If you feel invisible, if you recognize that there are so many people out there doing what you do, it is your way to stand and rise and shine. It is your perpetual resume. It is your perpetual ability to open up doors for multiple opportunities that I'm going to share with you in just a minute. Does anybody have a question about this slide? So I'm either awesome or boring the heck out of you. <laughs> Are you going to go into which software is as uh, next? Are you going to go into which software is more turnkey? So if you want to subscribe to a podcast and it prompts a pop up more often, this this was designed to just be a very general overview. That would be a wonderful secondary invitation. Um, but I will try to answer any specific questions. Yeah. Um, I've been kind of looking at Snapchat quite a bit oh, more, yeah. and I was wondering if you've looked into ways to incorporate a podcast into stories or anything like that. That's really cool. The way I would do that is I would actually, if I had the ability, and I, I would, I would actually do some Snapchatting while I'm doing podcasting. I would incorporate, or I know Periscope was trying to take off for a while now with Facebook Live. I usually just kind of dovetail those. But yes, I think that there would be ways, especially if you're like, dude, I just interviewed this person. Like for me, I deal with really um, crazy stuff, so I can do the shock factor thing. Mm -hmm. Well, when you say the people, so Libsyn or Blurberry, there are different hosts, right? And you need to really do your research because some are fly by night, some are not really making it. And you, the, the thing is, is that you want to make sure that wherever your stuff lives, that you get to keep it if they go away. So there are some, um, what I call the granddaddies, and I, I, for me, it's Libsyn. Number one, they have multiple levels of storage and prices that are very affordable. They give you amazing stats. So when people want to do advertising, it's really easy for you to show that. Um, the, the way you can drill down information as far as Facebook ads, um, I, for whatever reason, have a huge following in the UK. Like, who would have known that? Because I can't see the UK iTunes ratings and reviews. I can only see America's. So by looking at my lips and stats, I know I want to target people at a certain age range that live in the UK because they like my show. So yes, you do pay. Mine is, runs $30 a month, just to give you an example. And I release two times a week. Okay. 
Unexpected benefits of podcasting. You reach people who you would not have had access to otherwise. So an example is me standing right here. Because I'm a podcaster, I have this really cool and unique opportunity. And I've had multiple opportunities like this. Not only that, because I am the show host, I have access to people who are looking to promote either a book or themselves or a talk or what have you. And there's this sense of um, celebrity and credibility that comes between my brand. I mean, I'm not going to lie, that has a lot of weight, but also the podcast, when you combine the two, I have been able to secure some really cool um, guests, and I really underestimated the enthusiasm that people were going to have to be on my show. I've actually had to create an application process, and I never saw that coming, so I've been able to be pretty um, exclusive about who has been able to be on the show. Not only that, you have access to people as far as being a speaker, as far as being a guest on other people's shows. Shows, um, it really opens doors for you. So for you in this world, it could really open a door for you to get in with some bigger companies. I don't know what your end game and goals are, but it can it really can set you apart. Um, it's authority in pop culture, media, and the social sphere. So I am known in pop culture as America's crisis coach. One of the ways that happened for me is Huffington Post got a hold of me and they um, had me on Nancy Red's show multiple times and that generated a lot of buzz and a lot of interest. Another way is that I became a paid writer for Answers.com which was fairly lucrative. So it has created opportunities for me and it just adds to my platform and my, my resume that I have a podcast. Um, guest appearance opportunities, perfecting your communication skills. If you are to go back, we were talking earlier about some of the podcasts that people listen to. If you listen to Pat Flynn's first episode, it's a train wreck. You know, if you listen to John Lee Dumas's first episode, a train wreck. By the time you hit about the 50 episode mark, something magical just happens. And you just get this presence, this confidence, this control of the mic, and a way of using your voice that's just amazing. I was on a phone call the other day. It was a sales type of call. And the guy just says, can I just say something? Sure. He goes, you know, you have such a great voice. You should be on radio. And it just becomes part of your persona and, and your presentation. Another thing that's really cool about it is I'm Greek, and you can tell I'm fairly demonstrative. Behind the mic, I can just be as, you know, moving as I want. I have a much more difficult time when I keynote because, you know, I, I want to stand and I want to be, you know, in control of my physicality. I love my podcast because I can get as excitable as I want and nobody knows, <laughs> which is really nice. And if you're shy, one of the things I will say, I am an introvert. And most people who are in tech or who are in podcasting, they tend to be introverts. Now, I can turn it on. I know how to represent my brand. I know how to show up powerfully. But I was at um, the Gamification Summit for two days over the weekend. And I literally today didn't want to talk to anybody because I'd been so drained of my own energy. Podcasters, we have the ability to turn it on for that amount of time and then turn it off. And it's a really wonderful use of, our, um, of our, uh, the batteries that we have you know, that need to be recharged. Uh, repurposing content. So if you're a blogger, if you have written white papers, if you have a book, if you have done anything out there and you have this content that's sitting aside. I was a um, columnist for 10 years. So I have, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of columns. And I can draw from those and repurpose that content if I choose to. My podcast is an interview-based uh, platform. However, my audience would love it if I did a bonus. Like if I did a bonus monologue audio and offered this really cool content, they would eat that up. And I have all that just living out there. So I can repurpose that in a better way. Collaboration opportunities. One of the things that I love about podcasting, it's the most loyal, interactive, collaborative, group of people in the universe. There are communities of us and we just support one another. And once word gets out that you're a great host or you're a great guest, you never have to want because you will always have guests coming and you always have speaking opportunities for yourself to promote your show because it's such a collaborative environment. There's no sense of competition. It's a great, great opportunity. Uh, you get colleagues with outside expertise to barter with. So a lot of people start podcasts for various reasons. I have had the benefit of helping people with branding. I happen to have an expertise in imagery and creating your brand and marketing it in a way that is really exciting for people. Now, if that's not your bag, but you're really good about, say, 
tech or um, you understand like mics and soundboards and this thing, like we're a perfect fit because that's where I'm weak. So we can come together and collaborate and you get free things that we're, I mean, I would charge people a lot of money to talk about um, branding and developing that and all that. But when we're bartering, it's just completely just to support one another. Does anyone have any questions here? Uh huh. Yes. So it's not. Yes. So don't overthink it because when we get into communities, I'm going to show you that it's very easy and effective way to actually elevate your status very quickly. Okay. So we will touch on that. So no, it isn't. I mean, yes, I have built a platform. My background is all in psychology. I worked for 22 years in the fields of mental health, family court services, and social work. So I've worked with thousands of people in the crisis arena, but actually I've only been a podcaster for a short time. My career as far as um, being an author and things like that, that's been in the last five years. And I know that might sound like a long time, but it's actually been fairly quick. And my learning curve, one of the reasons I love talking about this, is I've paid a lot of money to understand the things that I have, right? I've paid for a lot of coaching, a lot of services, and I really have a heart for paying that forward so you don't have to take five years to get where I am. So I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Just curiosity. Mm -hmm. Pod episodes out or podcasts? How many episodes? I have, woo -hoo -hoo, I'm close to 50 at this point. This is my second podcast. Yes. And I have what we call in the can. I still have about 20 in the can. So they've been recorded and they're coming out. Yeah. Have you been on the cruise, the podcast? Cruise I haven't <laughs> yet. I don't know how I feel about that, but I have been to Podcast Movement, and that is, again, about community. So I went to Podcast Movement last year before I released, and that is a wonderful networking opportunity. And people, as I said, that community wants to love on each other. It's not... Um, you know, exclusive and, and people want to collaborate. So going and making those connections and then being very involved in social media, those were two of the key things that have really helped me. So when I launched, I had an actual launch team. I had people rallying behind me to, to make some things happen. Pedro, um, so I think the, the idea of doing, you know, signing up for a weekly podcast is probably pretty daunting for a lot of people, or I think yours is twice a week, isn't it? Yes. Um, so um, is there value in doing either a less frequent podcast or a podcast maybe that only runs for a short period of time? Maybe it's a, a 10 episode series or something like that. What is the kind of the benefit around something of a more limited? Yes. Uh, Yes. So some people do what they call a season, which if you think about TV, you know, we have seasons and they want to build in those break points and that's fine. Some people release a podcast once a month. Some people do it every other week. Here's the thing. Just be consistent because if people subscribe to you, they know your schedule. And there is so much competition out there that the moment you don't deliver, they're, on, they're fickle. They're, they're off to the next person because people are coming in the podcasting world all the time and people are gonna do shows similar to what you're wanting to do. So if you're not there when you say you're gonna be there, the loyalty fades quickly. So as long as you do what you say you're gonna do, it's completely fine. Yeah. So you mentioned that you have 20 episodes in the can. Mm -hmm. How many episodes do people typically prepare before they do their initial release? Great. So. I recommend, and it's sort of the standard in the group that I run in. Now, mind you, there are people who choose not to be in groups, so they're kind of on their own. And if you look at their um, situations on iTunes, you can see that they don't have the benefit of community. I suggest that you um, release a minimum of three, ideally five. Now, again, that could be five minutes, that could be 15 minutes, it could be half an hour. I guarantee you, a half an hour goes this fast when you're behind that mic. It really does. I try to keep my episodes at half an hour, and they tend to creep more to 44, 45 minutes. So it, it is, it, time flies when you're having fun kind of thing, right? Um, so 
I released with five. I release every um, twice a week. I release on Monday and Wednesday. And then um, a lot of people, I mean, I know people who had 60 episodes in the can. For me, I don't care for that because I feel like life changes, right? So if I'm doing an episode in August and I'm not going to release it until November, that is a, that for me doesn't work. But I also wanted the flexibility, like say I, I deal in the world of crisis, if there's something that goes down and I have access to interview somebody and bring content to what I call the brave nation, I want to be able to plug that episode in. So I like the flexibility and that kind of goes back to what I was saying, having complete control. Yeah. Um, and I got to tell you, I'm the, least, I'm the lowest tech person there is. And we're going to talk about the tech about in just a minute and I don't want to overstay my welcome. but. It's not, it's not scary. Okay, now let's talk about how to start a podcast. So community, community is so vital. I happen to be part of John Lee Dumas. He, he started Entrepreneur on Fire. Have any of you ever heard of that podcast? Okay, so Entrepreneur on Fire started when John Lee Dumas was commuting to a soul-sucking job that he hated, and he was a voracious consumer of podcasts. And he was so frustrated because the people he wanted to follow were only releasing once a week. And it's like, okay, I, I can't get content. So he decided to release a seven day a week podcast and he was completely encouraged to not do that, which he didn't listen to it. And thankfully he's created a multi-million dollar uh, scenario within three years. I think he launched in 2013. Um, and now he's, he, he still does his podcast, but now he has grown his empire through teaching people how to podcast, teaching people how to do webinars, and he's also amassed um, enough income that he's now doing more philanthropic thing, and so he's making money, you know, hand over fist. So he started a community called a Podcaster's Paradise. The whole purpose of it was for him to make money. It was his first way to make money and monetize his podcast, because remember, it's a freemium. So people would join his community and number one, you would get this Facebook group and that Facebook group is worth every dollar that I paid. I paid a one-time fee and I have lifetime membership. You also get this entire library, literally videos on every aspect of podcasting that you could ever want, PDFs on any type of content you could use, form letters, I mean literally anything under the sun. So it was a no fail situation and they keep it updated and, and, and active all the time. Now he's not even active in the group anymore because it's self-sustaining and there, there are heroes within the group and there are heroes from all walks of life. So there are people who know about production, there are people who know about equipment, there's people who can troubleshoot um, because you get all walks of life coming into podcasting. Some who don't realize you need a website, some who don't realize you need actually a microphone. I mean, it's just crazy. But the support is built in and that's where that bartering comes in. I've had my bacon saved more than once and I've been able to pay that forward more than once. And it, people are there 24 seven, <laughs> which is really, really nice. Equipment. The equipment is very low tech. Yes, you can get incredibly sophisticated if you want. There are people who do. But I have an ATR2100, which is a mic that I got from um, Amazon. It's on a tripod. Um, it has a pop filter. I have a lot of percussion in my voice, so I needed to be very careful. A lot of people use Blue Yetis. Those don't work for me because I just have too much going on with my voice. I have a great set of Audio-Technica headphones. I have an iMac. And I use um, uh, Skype, I use um, eCam call recorder to do my calls. And it's wonderfully painless because I am very low tech. You just click a button, I can see it working the whole time. And um, when I'm done, I just drag my, it, for me it's a Mac, an iMovie file over to the MP3 converter. Boom, I send it to my VA and she magically makes everything happen. So for me being very low tech, super simple. And on PC, it's the same exact setup. You just, I think they call it um, Pamela for Skype, I think is what the recorder is. Um, again, very low tech. If you wanna have a, um, a monologue, most people use Audacity, which is a free platform, very simple. A lot of people, if you're more sophisticated, are gonna use something in the, um, in the Adobe suite, um, 
Adobe Audition, and that's if you're a little bit more sophisticated. I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole <laughs> because I'm too scared, but I might not be a year from now. You know, you kind of grow with it. So your recording mechanisms are the ones I just shared. Album art you saw. Album art, you know, is really important. Unless you're trying to look, you know how there's like some guys that can look all hipster and it works for them and some guys who try it and it just doesn't work? You really need to know your brand because if it's perceived as offbeat cool, that's awesome. But if it's perceived as offbeat junky, it's going to get bypassed. One of the benefits of community is people will come in with their album art and they'll have like three or four examples and they'll get free, awesome feedback. And you don't have to, you know, fail forward that way. You can actually really know out the gate what you've got. And a lot of it is sizing. We call it the sugar cube test. On most um, devices, your podcast album art is going to be the size of a sugar cube. So you want to make sure you're checking, choosing imagery and fonts that could be seen you know, from, remember, 18 to 44-year-olds, well, I know my eyes are starting to go. <laughs> so you want to make sure that it can be seen on all platforms. Your out intro and your outgo. These are the world according to Phaedra, what I think is valuable. Um, I didn't know how to do an audio in my slide deck because I'm low tech, but I invested the money, and when I say that, I think it was about $250 to have a high-end professional intro and outgo. The reason I did that is, as you can imagine, my presence is pretty large. So when I start my podcast, this is how I start. Hey, hey, Bravehearts, it's Phaedra, America's crisis coach, and you have found Coming Out of the Fire, the podcast that features all my friends who have been through the unimaginable and fought back. So lean in, take care, take heart, and take a moment to welcome so-and-so to the show. So I have this presence. I didn't want to have some funky music and then just come at people, right? So my intro is super high energy. It's got um, a lot of, like, um, it sounds kind of piratey. I mean, it's, it's interesting. And it's at the same rate that I come in. So there's a seamlessness, right? And people love that. Um, I get a lot of positive feedback on my intro. And I have a, sh a long one and a short one. Because people who are loyal listeners, dude, they don't want to listen to your <laughs> intro every time. They just want to get to it. And some of us know how to fast forward and some don't. So I release Monday's episode with the longer intro. And then I have a second intro that's the same flavor, the same music, but it just gets to the point quickly. And then I have an outro. So it features, and I can drive traffic, again, to a, uh, an opt-in possibility. So I highly recommend, you can just see the difference in people who don't have great album art and don't have great intros and outgoes. Your format, we've talked about, monologue, interview, you can have co-hosts. Your website and your hosting, a lot of people don't realize you have to have a website. So it can be a landing page, it can be a one-pager, it doesn't need to be sophisticated, but don't do it. Um, you want to have sophisticated hosting because if your show goes really, really well, you don't want to crash or be kicked off a server because so much traffic is going to your, to your show. Um, editing plan and software, we talked a little bit about that. And you want to have a launch plan. So being a part of a community, it's much easier to have a launch plan. And sometimes the launch plan is just going to be your mom and dad, you know, or your, your fraternity brothers or whatever. But you definitely want to have a plan. Has anyone ever heard the term thunderclap? So in the book writing industry, one of the ways that I was able to um, capture being a best-selling author was that we did what's called a thunderclap where we had a plan where everybody I had been building momentum with went to Amazon at a specific time of day and bought my book <laughs> and then they rated and reviewed it and because I drove so much traffic to my book I was able to capture the um, number one spot in Amazon and it's the same thing with the podcasting. You have a plan. I did things really, um, I, we assume that people know nothing. So I did a lot of screen capture. This is how you go to iTunes with arrows. This is how you subscribe. This is how you rate. Oh, by the way, I'm having a contest. So once you rate and review, click this button and you get entered in to win. For me, it was a $100 uh, Starbucks card because I use that a lot in my branding. So having a launch plan is going to help you land that new and noteworthy where you are going to be recommended and that traffic is you're going to see spikes in your traffic, which is really good for you. And again, you want to have a way to capture people on your list because ultimately what you're trying to do is start a relationship. 
It's, some people, you could be a podcaster as a hobbyist. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There are a lot of fan casts out there, like when Twilight was on or whatever, like they just want to get on and talk about that. There's ones that they'll develop short term, like around Deadpool. There's podcasts that are just like dissecting that. Downton Abbey. I mean, there's fan casts yeah. out there. Yeah. So for the Thunder Club, how many people are we talking about? I think that you just need to do what you can do, right? I wouldn't spend a ton of time saying, well, I have to have these certain numbers because the algorithms are not finite. There's no requirement. There's no minimum requirement. I think that you just need to see a lot of activity going on. Does anybody have a question about this? I know we're getting close to the end. Uh -huh. Just to, I was just going to ask, um, could you just throw out some quick values for some of these things, like what, are we talking $10,000? Are we talking $200? Oh, okay. Thank you, no, no. Like We're talking less than $200. Less than $200. I mean, well, let me go piece by piece. So if we wanna talk community, there are multiple communities. All you need to do is go to Facebook and start typing in keywords, and there's lots of free communities, and that's great. Get into everyone that you can. I'm probably a member in about two or three. Now, as far as John Lee Dumas, I think the last time I checked, it's like $1,600 to $2,000 is well worth the money, and he has a payment plan. And you're in it forever, and that, um, that camaraderie, it pays for itself very, very quickly in troubleshooting and not having to pay what I call stupid tax. <laughs> so you'll save money. Um, the equipment is very affordable. Now, I wanted to be like the big guys. I wanted a boom mic so bad with like a flag on it with my podcast art and everything, and I bought one. And I kept having problems, and I tried to um, recruit people to help me, and people were on Skype, and I was paying people. And what it was is I had a dud mic. But because I'm so low tech, I didn't know it. I thought I was the dud. So I spent a lot of money, and um, I'm not a big fan of BSW for audio because they really weren't very supportive for me. And as a matter of fact, I use social media to kind of twist their arm to give me a refund, which they did, um, but I had to get kind of kind of snarky with them. Um, so I ended up getting an ATR2100 off Amazon. I think it was like $89. That thing is beautiful. I have been on some very famous podcasts as a guest, and every time they're like, oh, your sound is so great. I'm like, whatever. And like, I know I don't have near what they have. So it's very affordable. Audio Technica headphones, I think, were like $80. Your album art, now, some people, if you're savvy, you can do it yourself, right? Are there any Photoshop experts here? Do you have access to Photoshop experts? You can use virtual assistants. You can also use Fiverr if you know what you're looking for. If you're very specific, you'll be fine. The key to it is just go surf the album art. Find someone you like and emulate what they have. Look what's in the top 100s. How are they doing it? You know, you want to have clear, crisp art with very readable fonts. So if you are very specific about what you want, you're going to keep those costs way down. I think, well, I didn't pay anything for my album art because I knew what I was doing. I strategically took the imagery, so I did have the um, expense of the photo shoot, but I used that in multiple ways. So um, the intro and the outgo, like I said, I spent about $240 worth every penny. As a matter of fact, when I wanted the shorter one, I just went back to Tim Page. He's another very famous artist. and. Um, he just did it for free because I had been so active in the community. Again, it, there's that sense of reciprocity that's really, really important. Um, so does that help? Yeah, yeah, very low, low cost. Do you do your sponsorship in the beginning and or do you cut in the middle? So I offer choices. There's pay, what you're gonna pay for. If it's in the beginning, people are more apt to hear it and stick with it and then also how long it is matters and what you're going to offer. So if there's like an affiliate program where I can get um, the opportunity to make more money in a different way, I might lower the cost um, for the sponsor. So it just really depends. I know that people who are on John Lee Dumas's, they're paying way more uh, to be at the front of the role versus at the end of the role. But he also has a mid role, so it just depends. Do you do that live or do you splice? Do you do it before? You splice it in. You splice it in, yeah. okay. Bake it is what they call it, yeah. Yes, and, and there's so many different ways to do the promotion and all that. I just wanted to give a general overview tonight. I get excited. I'm like, oh, and you can do this and you can do that, but I got I to gotta calm myself down. Okay, so podcasting is easy, and you can start in two ways. You can go, totally go done for you. There are people out there who 
like me, have had the experience and they discovered that they are really good at one aspect of it or whatever, and they've actually developed businesses now where they will just do it for you. They will set up everything that you need. It's gonna be anywhere from $500 to a few thousand. It just really depends on how savvy you are, how, how specific you are, the more direction you can give somebody, and, and vetting the person who is doing the done for you. Make sure you're getting recommendations. I would encourage you to get into a community. Lots of people People do that and they're just like hey I'm just thinking about this and they kind of stalk and watch for a while and see who kind of contributes and knows their business and then they start to get involved if you were to listen to like John Lee Dumas's show you know he's affiliating with lots of people so he's gonna drive you to his people that charge ten thousand dollars to do it you don't need that that doesn't have to happen or DIY or a hybrid I'm a hybrid there were things that I knew how to do and things that I didn't know how to do things that I didn't know how to do before I know how to do now so it's an evolution so listen to podcasts to get inspired before you decide listen to monologues listen to co-hosts listen to interviews listen to intros and outgoes listen to the different um, categories because you want to get a flavor of what you like I have this belief that there could be this really awesome podcast for like a runner, like a like a Iron Man person or something like that, who actually does their podcast, records their podcast on their iPhone while they're training. And you hear their voice and you hear that. I, I just have this knowing that people would love that. So being out of the box, because right now, like people will listen to John Lee Dumas and think, well, that's the way to podcast. But we don't need another John Lee Dumas, right? We need something spicy. We need something new and interesting. I think we're about to sit down. So here's the summary. Podcasting is going to help you establish yourself as an expert in your field. This is an interesting thing. I met this guy who is a realtor, right? Now, I'm going to use a book example. This guy has set himself apart as a very high-end realtor. The way he did it is he just wrote a book. Books in my world are business cards. You can write a book for very affordable. Um, I have my own publishing company. I can put up books fairly affordably, and that will set you apart as an expert in your field. Him being able to go to multi-million dollar properties and saying, hey, before you put this on the market, here's this book I have that shows you everything you need to consider when picking a realtor and preparing your home for sale. He gets so many people because he has this perceived authority, right? Because nobody else in his industry is passing out these books. Same thing for you. You will have a perceived authority, which is, so, is righteous, you deserve it, but there's also this echelon, just like you thinking, oh, it's so, you know, so much. It's not, it's not. It's just that I'm walking this walk and other people aren't. So if you bring yourself into that, you're in the 1%, right? And it helps with that expert in your field. It's gonna grow your customer base, it's gonna build relationships, show your, podcast, uh, your product services or your brain trust. A lot of people have a widget out there, but Maybe your podcast is like, the, uh, ex is like the manual that goes along with your widget, right? So if you have this thing you do, this whatever, and then your podcast is all about how to make it better or how to you know, hack it or how to you know, whatever um, enhance that experience, that is going to be fascinating and your customers are going to eat that up. It's going to build relationships, as we said, show... Um, has a better ROI than trade, traditional advertising. Again, it's evergreen, right? And it is um, able to be shared in so many different ways. If you just go and sponsor something, not to play this down, but if you just go sponsor something, you've only reached these people. But if you're sponsoring through podcasts and the airways, your reach is literally un you know, unlimited. And as far as sponsors, what is so great is with niche marketing, you guys familiar with that term? Niche marketing is having um, an area of expertise or an area of um, exposure that is an inch wide and a mile deep. If you are, like a perfect sponsor for me is insurance. Because I'm talking about all the crappy things that can happen to you, right? Oh, and here's my friend, the insurance guy. Or an attorney's firm, or like, um, what are those, some of those um, um, insurance, not um, legal, legal aid that's like universal, you know, they would be excellent sponsors for me because people are scared after they listen to my show. Um, it maximizes and creates repurposes content. So I just want to open up to um, any questions that you guys have because I am done with my overview. I have a question um, about your preparation process. Okay. 
So could you kind of walk us through the, the amount of time that you spend? Mm -hmm. Do you research your guests? Um, what does that look like? So everybody does it different, and that's what's so great. I, I cringe at the people. Um, they have what they call show notes. And so show notes are like the highlight reel. And I see people who do show notes that says, at space 12 minutes, 49 seconds, they talk about this. At space 20 minutes, to the, and I'm like, oh, no, no. That is going to make me hate my podcast. I come at it, my background is in interviewing. I mean, as a social worker, I have people telling me their whole lives. So, so it's very easy for me to get people to talk. And I understand psychology, so I know how to kind of sheep herd people where I want them to go. So for me, I don't require a lot. What I do do is in my application process, I ask for very targeted and specific questions that get me the information that I want. And I'm able to get it in a really succinct way. Now, I was on Join Up Dot, which is a very famous podcast out of the UK. And he did the most amazing um, introduction I've ever had. Like, I feel like I was at the Academy Awards. He had found my resume on LinkedIn. He had, you know, stalked me on all my different social media and um, the links of where I've been shown in, in the news and things like that. So I was like, I felt like 10 feet tall, right? I am not going to put that effort into my guests because I will hate my podcast. Some people have teams. They're just the talent and they have minions that do all of that and they plop it right in front of them, you know, in 15 minutes before they consume the information. So it really can be what you want it to be. Um, this is two questions, I guess. Okay. Uh, how large is your audience uh, currently? So I, um, this particular podcast launched on December 28th and I am well over 25,000 downloads. So okay. that's, that's good numbers. So that's like a, a certain amount of subscribers and then that's multiple episodes. Or so that. you can't, there's no way to tell who has subscribed to your podcast, but you can tell who's, you can see the number of downloads. Okay. So you can, and you can break it down into minutia. Downloads per episode, downloads um, who, who lives where that downloaded it. Um, you can't tell why, but okay. you can get lots and lots of very specific information. Um, so with those 2,500 or 25,000. Um, how are you able to monetize it and what does that mean as you scale? Um, so, like say now you're at a 250,000. Correct. So there's no guarantee through podcasting that you're gonna monetize. There's no guarantee in anything in life that you're gonna monetize. You have to have a savvy business head. So you have to have a monetization plan and you have to be in it for the long haul. There are people who out the gate, when Tim Ferriss launches, his podcast, it's going to be instant, right? Um, if you don't get on new and noteworthy, you're going to have a harder time. If you don't have a social media presence, you're going to have a harder time. If, you're, if your demographic isn't in that 18 to 44 affluent person, they're not going to listen. You know, if your expertise is in geriatric care, those people aren't going to care about a podcast, right? And there's trends. Right now, serial, um, how to, the making of a murderer, all those kind of crime drama, that's hot. So it's going to get more traffic. So as far as monetizing, some of it is a bit of spaghetti at the wall. You've got to see. But you also can make educated, calculated guesses and have a, your back in, your opt-in. That's where you really you know, have the opportunity um, to um, test your market, you know, engage with them directly and see what it is. So it's kind of like... Um, <coughs> You're most likely not going to monetize your podcast. You're going to monetize a subsequent result from your podcast. Okay, so the, but the sponsors that you're getting are paying you to be there, right? Mm-hmm. How, how, how do they scale with you? Um, and and uh, how do they find you? Do they find you or do you find them? It, or do they go through an agency that says, oh, this, this woman has this and this demographic and, that, and you might want to be on there? Yes. Okay. Right? So how did I get on Huffington Post Live first? They found me. How did I get sizzle reels for reality TV? They found me. They're Googling. They're minions. They're, you know, interns and all that. They're always looking for fresh new stuff. It's the same thing with podcasting. It's competitive. What they look for is longevity. The average podcast only lasts, like, um, I think they said 25 episodes. Like, it's kind of like books. The average amount of books sold is 2,500. So they look to see who's sticking around. They look to see 
what's hot, who's talking about you, you know, who are you, who are you friends with, they're vetting you, who's on your Twitter feed, you know, who's, so you can be very strategic, like, do, do any of you know Joe Calm? So he created the Fart app, which was a total joke, and he made millions off of it. So he's a friend of mine. So my girlfriend and I, one of the things that I built my podcast on is I started with my friends. I started interviewing my friends because I've met a lot of people who've gone through quite a bit. And because of it, I already had this rapport with them. So our interviews are really powerful. And we would mention people we knew. So I name dropped Joel Calm because, you know, whatever, we're friends, but he wasn't on the show, right? But my girlfriend and I know him, we're talking about him. So when I released that episode and I tweeted, hey, Joel, we were talking about you in the podcast, he gets in, he's like, what were you saying? I was like, well, this is what we said. He goes, oh, yeah, I remember that. So it was a way of passively engaging not only him, but his audience and his endorsement. And so there are lots, again, that's kind of branding and, and marketing and media. That's kind of my thing. So you just have to get super creative because there's no guarantees. There are really, really good podcasts out there that nobody knows about. One of the ways that community really benefits you is ratings and reviews. So I was able to get over 100 reviews really quickly because I had a great team. And one of the things we do is pay it forward Friday. A pay it for it fried right we get together and we rate and review people and we don't we do it honestly I if I listen to your show and it sucks I'm gonna private message you and say dude could I offer you some feedback yes you'll accept it okay I'm gonna come back three episodes later because I'm not gonna endorse junk I'm not gonna just promote you because I scratch my you know each other's backs but it is a really great way to not only um, build up your ratings and reviews, but to find good content, good guests. And one of the things we all do in social media is I can't just be promoting myself. I can't just be self-righteous, but I can be promoting your podcast. Oh my God, did you check out all oh, my friend? You know, And that sense of we're in a brotherhood, sisterhood, it's very, very powerful. And that you never know who you're gonna reach. So as far as advertising, one person, like the one I released today was about a woman who, um, her mother was stalked, they stole and tortured their animals, and the guy that was doing the stalking tried to frame the woman's father for murder. So my titles are really catchy, right? And when she promoted her podcast, I all of a sudden got a ton of people coming in to consume my other content. So you just don't know when it's, when it's going to come. Stalkers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, two things. So I assume it generates a URL and that you could push that out through all your channels, like, hey, here's a podcast, so mm -hmm. you can get it out that way, yes. right? And then uh, how does the keyword thing work? You were mentioning that it's keyword rich. Is that an actual recording or is that a metadata? Like, how does that work? It is both. And again, you're getting into territory that I leave to my okay. VA. I know some things, I'm a writer at heart, um, a content writer, a copywriter. Um, but yes, um, when we do an excerpt, I, use, I try to be very keyword, keyword rich. And she does pull from some metadata that goes into Libsyn. And then um, go, um, iTunes is a search engine as well. So if you were to search my name, you would see any podcast I had ever been on, which is awesome. And you would also see any episode I've ever done, which that cross-pollination is amazing. And when I promote in social media, I don't promote my iTunes link because not everybody has iTunes. So I do promote my specific URL that I created for that episode. And it's usually the person's name. It's not the title of the, um, of the episode. Mm -hmm. Hi, what kind of podcasts are there? You mentioned that there's a co-host and a monologue, I believe, and an interview. Are there other types? That yes, there are people um, really playing right now in um, like storytelling and doing the whole, on this episode, this happens. And that's new and fun, exciting, because I don't know about you, but I use Audible, and I have to pay for it. So there's a lot of people who are trying to get recognition as authors, and they're, they're storytelling. There's one called The Bunker. It's really cool. It's like a post-apocalyptic thing, and it's supposed to be kind of cool. And it, it's like cool. It's like, it's, it's like, it's like um, Oh, George Orwell, like, you know, the world ended kind of thing, and he's reporting from the bunker. So that's really cool. I think it's really um, fun. And I think that we're going to start to see a lot more younger people, middle schoolers, high schoolers, starting to uh, do the podcast. And what's great about that, if you were to do a podcast, you would get so many people behind you because it's the cute factor. It's like, oh, my gosh, look at him. He's a teenager, and he's doing this. You would get so much play for that. 
Totally recommend that. <laughs> Did that answer your question thoroughly? Thank you. I have another one. Oh, sure. Uh, I'm just starting two businesses right now. Uh -huh. The world of entrepreneurism is brand new to me. And I, and I saw podcasts as a way to create a following before we start making any money, really. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any content that you recommend that I consume? And also, as a new entrepreneur who wants to make a podcast, do you have any tips that you, weren't, that you didn't get through in your presentation? I think I covered really thoroughly the overview, and a lot of that came from the fact that I had a podcast previously and made a lot of the mistakes. I didn't have the things in place that I had the second go around, so I saw a dramatically different experience. Um, one of the things that I did, I'm fairly snarky, and people tell me I'm funny. You probably didn't pick up on that here, but... <laughs> I do, because I talk about really dark subject matter, and I'm a first responder, and first responders, we tend to use humor or, um, you know, different ways to protect our hearts for the stuff that we've seen in our lives, and um, I listened to comedians a lot before I started hosting my show, because if there's nobody out there like you, you start to think, well, maybe that's not the way. I can't be authentic, and I can't show up who I really am, but I'm telling you that me being the way that I really am um, has been what people are saying they love about my podcast, that I do it in such a way. So I would encourage you to go out, and you know yourself, but if you don't see anyone else like you, go out there and find people that you um, are inspired by, and get yourself filled up that way, before you make any decisions. <laughs> so, so today it was really hard for me to get my question on because there were so many others. Uh, my final question is, uh, so, so do you have a rough number? How many people in the US are listening to podcasts like once a week or something like that? Is it growing, that it's number? It's in the millions. I mean, it's mm. the, literally in the millions. There are people who, like John Lee Dumas gets hundreds of thousands of downloads every single day. And it's worldwide. And that's what's so fascinating. Me being so popular in the UK, like, oh, yeah. who knew? And as far as opportunities, I mean, the opportunity for me to go and speak in the UK is fairly high because of that sort of thing. So yes, it's, it, and it's growing and growing as far as the numbers. Very cool, very cool. So today I think we had this positive double whammy that we learned something interesting, I certainly did. And it was also presented in a great way because you know how to talk and how to entertain people and how to get the message across, which was really ear candy. Oh. So thank you, thank you, this was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.